Welcome back to the Early Weigh-In Podcast. Last week wasn't the week that we hoped for. They were a tough night of fights to break down. We, uh, you know, had a good mindset going into them, but a lot of them didn't end up turning out how we wanted to. We finished a little under, uh, or a little over three units in the hole, but after a couple very good weeks in a row, it didn't really, you know, put a dent in our progress that too much, but look to come back with some redemption this week. It's UFC Fight Island 6, Ortega versus the Korean Zombie. This is a super, super good fight card, man. Yeah, I'm actually really looking forward to it. Um, you know, if you just kind of look at the odds on this card, you might think it was a Bellator event. but uh, <laughs> Absolutely, dude. There are some wide odds on this For uh, sure. throughout the entire card. Uh, as of last week, you know, like we always want to do a little quick little recap. The first fight we had played to Gary and Bekov, that fight under two and a half, and uh, just didn't have the ground control and stuff like we thought he would have. Didn't really look... Uh, as good as I thought he was good, gonna be. And maybe that's a, a testament to Bruno Silva. You know, he he showed a lot more potential than I thought he was, and uh, his wrestling really uh, played a factor in and to gear not being able to utilize his game plan. He did, man. And Bruno wore him out with that calf kick mm-hmm. a ton. I know the next fight. Uh, uh, yeah. So we thought we had a read on Stephanie Egger. Um, uh, I think you know Paul Felder. He made that comment about how she hasn't really fought inside of an octagon, and usually it's inside of a ring. And I think that that really played a factor. Tracy Cortez really, you know, used that used the cage to her advantage mm-hmm. and honestly dominated from from round one to round three. Yeah, and the next fight was Giga and Omar. We really thought that was going to go under two and a half, and you know the heat they were throwing. It really did have potential. I was, mm-hmm. you know. What I hate worse than losing a bet is passing up on one that you're all over, and I was all over Giga on Dog Odds at a plus 125, and I just didn't pull the trigger on it, really hesitating. But that was a super good fight. Um, then skipping over the Al Casey and Kelly fight, Impa and Buckley, man. Knockout of the uh, UFC history, maybe? And top five, without a doubt. That was mm-hmm. That was nuts, man. And, you know... Not only was the knockout crazy, but you know Buckley was really causing some trouble for Impa. Impa was not near as calm as we talked about. Kevin Holland was underneath, mm-hmm. you know, all those punches, and Impa almost got dropped and sat down a couple times in that fight. Hundred um, percent. Now I don't think that Buckley's going to be making a huge splash in the middleweight division. I'm not sold on him like that, but definitely a notable performance mm-hmm. that'll live on through decades of UFC highlights. And in the post weigh in thoughts, man, you know, even tried to reassure us some more the the weight advantage Nascimento was going to come in there with, and it did not play out in our favor. No, the uh, the 40 pounds really worked into Chris Dacus' advantage, his hand speed and footwork. Um, I mean, I know we only got to see it for about 40 seconds, right. but it far was superior. far superior. Uh, Tom Breeze and KB Bullard, man, uh, KB Bullard, he doesn't, he doesn't really belong in there uh, with Tom Breeze. Maybe not in the UFC, man. I, I think, yeah, I think he was like 8-0 going into that one. He uh, he definitely has some things that he needs to work on before really getting into that uh, UFC caliber of opponent. And then Zalal and Toporia, super, super close fight. Some of those grappling exchanges were, that's a, that's a fight I know we like to watch a ton. And, man, people were, you know, all over Toporia and stuff. Uh, we, we didn't pull the trigger on him, man, and he ended up getting that close decision win. And realistically, like I, in hindsight, I'm glad we didn't pull the trigger. Yeah, he, he seemed to dominate, especially in the grappling exchanges, but it wasn't a clear-cut victory like people were really thinking Taporia right. was going to get. Um, you know, shout-out to Zalal. I thought that his submission defense was exceptional, yeah. and that's something that I didn't think he had in his arsenal. So Yeah, and then Tom Aspinall, man, another win under two minutes. I think one of the only one or two plays we cashed in on that night, but we did go pretty heavy on Tom Aspinall inside the distance. Um, you know, I don't know why we didn't play the money line super heavy as well, because that'd have been a lot of ground we could have made up there. But I know we both really like Tom Aspinall. He's very well rounded and a really nice addition to the heavyweights. Hundred percent. And then uh, we had Marcus Perez mm-hmm. and Duplessis. Yeah, uh, Duplessis. He he really. You know, he shelled up that first first few minutes in that octagon. Now, we, we did call the under two and a half. I think that might have been the only prop bet that we hit for the night. Yeah. But uh, We wanted to double down. That was one of the post-weigh-in thoughts that we had talked about and stuff. Uh, you know, they were getting in each other's faces. We really didn't see that one going the distance. And it was finishing one, wasn't it? Yeah, 100%. I mean, if, if Duplessis didn't pull it out and that it looked like Marcus Perez was going to get the finish within mm-hmm. two, you right. know. Um, the next one was the heavyweight fight between Rothwell and Tibera, and that's mm-hmm. the one we're beating ourselves up over. Um, and we we were all over the Tibera money line minus one forty five. We we thought you know how much better he looked with the extra weight, and he was so much lighter on the feet. Man, he he really he didn't really abuse Rothwell, man, but he uh, 
He, I think he made Rothwell show the age and stuff in, in, in that fight. And coming into the weigh-ins, him weighing nearly the same weight as uh, Ben Rothwell, it really negated any of that size, size advantage yeah. that Ben Rothwell really relies on. And he just, he outclassed him. And I, I think that, um, you know, that shows, it shows that Ben Rothwell has been using his own gym, mm-hmm. has been, you know, practicing with him being the best one at his gym. I think that it shows where Marcin Tibera still has room to improve and he's sharpening his skills yeah. still. Couldn't agree with you more. I had one of my buddies text me as soon as it was over saying that he cashed big on Tibera by decision and we're both just shooting ourselves in the foot for not playing that ourselves. Mm-hmm. But the co-main, man, under two and a half, unlucky on that one. Edson, that straight right hand was too quick for mm-hmm. Mirakani. Man, it was landing right on the money. There was a couple chances for Edson to put that one away that we we didn't get. Yeah, maybe we should have played him uh, money line, but I didn't. I still don't think we had the value at whatever minus two twenty two. something. Yeah, yeah uh, there still wasn't value there. But Barbosa, I think that he's found his home. Uh, I think one forty five really is somewhere where he can make a splash in that division and uh, show us something. Have have at least a better better weight of victory or to the championship belt than he would at one fifty five. I'm with you, man. And then main event, a little uh, you know, another loss for us there. But we were we we called that one terribly. Yeah, honestly. we did, man. San Hagen looked. St. Hagen looked great. Uh, Marlon says the first round was close. I, I really do think St. Hagen won even that first round as well. The volume and the output. Um, most strikes per minute in bantamweight history, and that really showed, man. He he didn't let Marlon, you know, even even get a, a a second to think in there. No, uh, length really played a factor in that pressure that he poured on early. Marlon was kind of overwhelmed. Yeah, and so the last hat or like the last you know minute of that first round, and then up into the knockout, uh, Corey started working that body a whole lot with his left kick, with the knee when he clinched him, and um, I think that give credit to where it's due, man. I, I really do think that body work is is what caused that spinning uh, kick to land because he had just thrown it to the body, you know, and stuff. And Marlon, Marlon did, you know, duck to, you know, to kind of shell up the body and clip the top of the head, man. So I really do think that body work opened it up. Not that I think it would have gone any any differently, but I do think it was a slightly early stoppage. I think if Marlon wouldn't have, like, exaggerated that rollback Roll back. after taking that shot, he might have had, he might have let the, the ref might have let him, uh, you know, get an opportunity to try and... Yeah, for a spinning head kick, Marlon definitely looked all the way there. And, but I did see, a, I think it was a tweet by Mark Goddard or something like that. I think that's who was ref in the fight. He said not many people got to see it because it's off TV, but... But when Marlon was standing up, he was all wobbly and everything. So something we didn't really get to see. But from what I saw, I'm, stoppage was a little early in my opinion. A little early. Not that it would have changed the outcome. Absolutely. And then this, we got the Korean Zombie and Ortega going down this weekend. A nice set of, you know, another 12 or 13 fights that hopefully stay together. So yeah, to get right into it, man, the first fight of the night is the <clears throat> younger cousin of Habib. We have Syed Nurmagomedov, who's 13-2, and two, fighting the UFC newcomer and Mark Streigel, who's 18-2. and two. Um, just to kind of start with Syed, man, you know, they've got the Nurmagomedov name. Um, I think that's what's getting him these odds in these fights, you know, coming in at a 4-1 to favorite. Um, he is not a 4-1 to favorite in this fight um, by no means, man. And, you know, it doesn't really take an expert to look through that and to see that. We've seen him with lackluster performances in the UFC um, where we've seen, you know, Strigel win 14 of his 18 by sub, win all these grappling events. In uh, you know in Asia, be a featherweight champ in his uh, you know in his uh, smaller organization, man. So Syed definitely going to have the advantage on the feet, but you know he he tends to have an advantage on the ground with a lot of his opponents too, and I just don't see that with Mark Strigel. I don't either. Now you know <laughs> Nurmagomedov. It's one thing to note he's not actually Khabib's cousin. A lot of people like to say that, but he's just a close family friend. Mm-hmm. Um, he also doesn't fight like Khabib at all. Not so at I all. think people have that in their mind when realistically he is a striker, and he's honestly not that strong um, as far as like trying to get the fight to the ground or keep somebody yeah. uh, on the ground. He kind of gives up size advantage, and uh, although. You you wouldn't think that at 5'8 in the Bantamweight division. He's skinny. He you is know? skinny. He's very skinny. He uh, He's fought at flyweight before, and even in that flyweight fight against Justin Scoggins, he wasn't able to keep him on the ground. Um, it's, another, it's another smaller opponent that he struggled with, and looking at Mark, He's huge, man. Maybe one of the best bodies in bantamweight. And, and he used to be a previous featherweight, man. Youth the size is evident. It sure. shows. It shows. He's a uh, he's monstrous. Um, now this is his UFC debut, so like I can expect a little bit of jitters, and mm-hmm. I can understand, you know, maybe why people would lean lean towards Saeed, but. 
I really I, I don't like those odds at all. And there's a there's a line floating out there, uh, Strigel by submission at plus seven fifty that I really think that people should consider. I don't think that we're that we're going to play it on the podcast, but it is a line that's way too skewed and uh, I really think that that's Mark's path to victory yeah so with 14 of his 18 wins by submission that's without a doubt Mark Strigel's path to victory in this fight and and man Syed for my he is he's just a more rounded well-rounded fighter he has the much better striking between the two and I think he has the grappling to hang in there with Mark Strigel um much closer fight than the odds suggest for me. A uh, completely pass fight for me in general, but uh, I am going to lead with with the favorite and Syed to probably get the job done via decision. Yeah, you know, you talked about him being the more well, well-rounded fighter, and I do think that Syed has more paths to victory, obviously. But still, that line being so so big, I do like that mark by sub. Um, I would still play Nurmagomedov if you were doing a uh, you know a parlay or something like that. Uh, so moving on, we go to the light heavyweight division. Gadsim Morad and Tigulov coming in at 20 and 7 versus Maxim Grishin, who's 38 and 2. So both these guys, uh, Russian fighters. Now, Gadsim Morad, I, you know, something that I noticed is he's only made it out of the re- second round one time in his mm-hmm. career, and that's wins or losses. And it's 27 fights. Right. And I really, I really think that that speaks to to his game plan every single time. I've watched a couple of fights where he completely blows his wad in the first minute and a half and has nothing else to give. So unless he gets that first round submission, you know, I don't really see many paths to victory for him. Where Maxim Grishin, he's, you know, he took his UFC debut against Marcin Tibera and when all three rounds, he had pretty decent takedown defense, especially fighting the much bigger guy in Marcin Tibera. And, uh, you know, I got to think that Maxim's game plan coming into this is just to get it out of that first round. And I think that he could he could totally uh, just cruise to a victory, if not finish it inside the distance. Um, With that one, I think Antigulov, he blows his wad so early that um, if Maxim if Maxim does capitalize, I really do think that the under one and a half round sitting at almost, you know, pick them odds right Mm -hmm. now is the way to go just because. Gads Morad, he he throws everything out there really, really early, and I don't see that changing, especially when he's coming off of three losses. I can't imagine him being patient right now. Right. He's got to make an impact to even stay in the UFC. Yeah, man, so you're all over it, man. I'm, I'm right there with you. You've got uh, Gads Morov and Tikilov there averaging like one fight a year for the last couple of years and, and getting finished in every single one of them. Now he's fighting, you know, Mike, uh, Mikhail Olazacek. He's fighting... Um, you know, Ion Kutalaba and stuff. So, you know, he's not fighting slouches, but the Paul Craig loss is, is really bad. Mm-hmm. Like, if you know what one thing Paul Craig's going to do, it, it's pull guard and try to put you in a triangle or an arm bar. And, I mean, it just complete loss of fight IQ. Went out there, played right into Paul Craig's game plan. And he talked about him never being, you know, past the second round, but one time, man, in 27 fights. I think the under one and a half in this fight is an absolute killer bet at pick em odds. Mm-hmm. Grisham really does blow his wad in that first round, trying to go for so many takedowns, or Antigulov does, trying to go for so many takedowns. And we've seen Grisham, you know, like you said, uh, pretty impressive takedown defense against a much bigger opponent. And mm-hmm. Marcin Tibera, you know, Grisham came in that fight at like 222 pounds or something, giving up over 30 pounds there to Tibera. And, didn't look terrible. Being said, you know, Grishin is one of those guys that's getting a late start to the UFC. He's already 36 years old and just now making his second walk in the UFC. Um, ton of uh, ton of background though, man. And, and K1 and, and PFL, he's he's got a ton of experience there. He's 38, and then you know two draws as well. He's a great distance striker. So he's good with his right hand. He's got excellent kicks. Um, he really has a great left hook. Um, as he's backing up, man, I. Uh, I really do think Grishin's only shot at losing this fight um, is is by a first round submission, um, maybe in a first two and a half minute of submission, and and that's all Antigulov's got in the tank. Outside of that, Grishin I think is going to wear this boy out on the feet and has has enough to uh, stop the takedowns as well. Um, I love the under one and a half. 
I love any kind of Max and Grishin inside the distance bet on this fight, too. Totally agree. Um, you talked about Max and Maxim's experience. He's been a pro since 2008. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this fight, he's coming in with a five-and-a-half-inch reach advantage. I really think that that's going to play a factor, especially after seeing him utilize that takedown defense against Marcin Tibera. I don't think that Antigulov offers much more than Marcin would. And then a uh, little fun fact i got to throw out there. Uh, Maxim has a win over Alexander Volkov in yeah. 2010. And I thought mm-hmm. that that was pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, so you, uh, you touch on the reach, man. He's also coming at like 6'3 to Antigulov's 5'10. Yeah. I think he might even be shorter than what they got him listed at. There's going to be a serious uh, size discrepancy between the two, and Maxim Griffin uh, or Grishin is, is going to abuse this guy on the feet, man. I think I love the under one and a half, um, and I'm really going to monitor that inside the distance because I think he gets it done easily inside the distance. I like that. <laughs> so, third fight of the night, man, is Frost Zium, who's 10 and 3, fighting Jamie Malarkey at 12 and 3. This fight is a lightweight fight here, man, and both guys pretty young, and both guys were uh, on the receiving end of a you know a loss in their in their UFC debuts. You got a you you really got a really really young prospect in Frost <clears throat> Zium at 23 years old, fighting out of the Bulgaria top team and. Former K1 kickboxing champ, man, he, he's real good on the feet. He's got great combinations, um, throws really good, uh, you know, attacks up the middle, throws the front kick up the middle, has really good knees where he'll clinch up. But you can still tell he's young in his MMA game, man. And it's one of those guys that I'd like to see maybe come through the contender series or, or get a developmental deal because at 23, I, I just don't see, you know, I don't see him really standing a chance against some of these, you know, especially top lightweights in the mm-hmm. division and stuff. I think he's got a long way to go. Uh, this is a t- it's really a tough fight for me to call here because um, you've got Jamie Malarkey on the other hand who's taking some time off, but he's coming off the loss to Brad Riddell. That was, I mean, that was a serious beat down he took, man. I mean, even to the last bit, oh, when they were on their knees and Brad threw that last shot sitting on his knees, man, and just clocked him like, Malarkey is, he might be the toughest guy I've ever seen, like tougher than Darren Elkins, man, and that's hard to get. Uh, but there's one thing you got to say about Jamie Malarkey, and it, it's the it's the grappling advantage that he's going to have in this fight. It's it's something you just cannot overlook. Both of these guys don't really go to decision of Jamie Malarkey's 15 fights. He's only got two, two of them going to decision, and that Brad Riddell fight should have never made it to the judges, right. you know. So he really does... Uh, he has great takedowns that he mixes in with the striking, but he, he kind of uh, wasted the energy on him early in that Brad Riddell fight. And a great striker like Riddell, Riddell started really working the body, really gassed him. I I just I see Malarkey being you know the more experienced fighter here, um, probably going to make it the more modern style I, you know of fight. I think he's going to do a lot of clinch work up against the fence, work for the takedown. I'm really curious to see. The changes he's made from that Brad Riddell fight because he showed that um, if he can't get that takedown, he tends to get tore up on the feet, man. Yeah, so I'm with you on the read. I think that it is a tougher fight to call, but I do think that we're getting some um, legitimate value with Jamie Malarkey sitting at a minus 130 right now. Uh, a couple of things that I noted about Malarkey is that he really he fully commits to his te- his level changes. Uh, whenever he goes for a takedown, he will run that through to the cage, and um, that's something that uh, Faraz has really struggled with. And that Don Madge fight, yeah. uh, Don Madge had his way with him up against the cage. Uh, Faraz had no answer to that, and hopefully he's been working on that. Now, something that. I uh, will say is that uh, Faraz is definitely the tallest guy that Jamie Malarkey has ever faced. Mm-hmm. Whenever I was watching Malarkey's tapes, it, uh, he was facing guys that were 5'8", 5'7", and he was pretty comfortable with doing that, where Faraz, he's fought at middleweight and welterweight before this. Right. So he's going to be the bigger man, and I think that it'll it'll show inside the octagon. But I do think that Malarkey will still be able to implement his takedown heavy uh, attack. Mm-hmm. And... Um, You know, realistically, I I like Malarkey a lot, but you talked about his striking being kind of subpar. I'm with you. He does a lot of one-punch attacks. You know, he doesn't follow up with very many combos, and he's he's comfortable sticking behind that jab and then closing that distance whenever he wants to. Now, that's that's the thing, though. If Malarkey cannot get it to the ground, Faraz is is legit. You know, he's he's a big guy in there. Uh, his, obviously, I, I think he's got the striking advantage. I just did not see anything that would make me think that Malarkey isn't going to get to the takedown from that Don Match fight. Yeah. And realistically, that's the only fight that I really studied, and that was the only one that I think that I needed to study. That, yeah. that gave me all the answers I needed for Faraz's 
and you, defense. You were talking about Faraz's uh, giving up the underhooks like crazy, mm -hmm. and then noting that on some of those malarkey fights, he was really good at getting the double underhooks mm -hmm. up against the cage. So something to note there. We we both tend you know agree on this fight uh, that malarkey is probably going to get it done. Um, and like you said, at a minus one thirty, that's a straight pick for the podcast all yeah. day, man. This guy's twelve and three, um, with the three losses being to Brad Riddell, Volkanovski and Martin Wynn, who is the face of one FC now and stuff, man. So Malarkey's been in there with some tough dudes. People, Frosium's just not been in there with, man. And at 130, I'm with you, brother. We need to play that all the way. Yeah. All right, so we move on to a mid to some middleweights. Um, <laughs> Jun Young Park, the Iron Turtle, who's coming in at 11 and 4, versus the Welsh Wrecking Machine, John Phillips, at 22 and 10. Okay, so... Jun Young Park, he has a boxing heavy attack, mm -hmm. and in his first fight in the UFC, you would have thought that that's the only type of attack that he has. He didn't throw a single kick and got taken down plenty of times by uh, Fluffy Hernandez. Yeah. Now, in his second fight, when he fought, uh, help me out here, Mark Andre yes. Barut. Yeah. Bar Barut, yeah. Um, he started. He shot for like four different takedowns and was able to get them all. He threw low leg kicks. He threw a, a couple head kicks and completely changed his game plan. I think that he's really ra uh, rounded out his game in just one fight in the UFC or two fights in the mm -hmm. UFC. Where you move over to John Phillips, who's been a pro since '05. Um, he's a really big fan of Mike Tyson, and it shows. Yeah, he uh, really like Mike Tyson, right? <laughs> he uh, he. That's all he's got. Yeah. All he's got. He'll open up with a huge overhand left, and that'll be the first strike that he throws in every single one of his fights. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Park decided to try and time that first throw that he's going to throw. He does it in every fight mm -hmm. and shoot for a takedown early to try and wear on John Phillips. You know, John Phillips is coming off of that mauling by Kamzat Shemayev, and Just I got a couple like two months ago, man. You right. know, he took a beating in that fight. I, I got to think that that's still wearing on his head, and I I got to imagine somebody who's been a pro since 2005. He's not making a ton of changes I mean this is how he fights that's how he gets his wins and uh, you know he has a hundred percent finish rate 19 KOs and three subs but I don't think those three subs have come anytime recently right um, now you know John Phillips one and four in his last five uh, I got to think if he loses this one he might be out of the UFC I think that him fighting out of SBG Ireland it's got to it's got to help yeah you know as far as as far as just getting the the nod just because of who you're training with but, um, you know, I think John Phillips would like to back Park up against the cage and try and, you know, try and overwhelm him with strikes. I don't think that Park's going to give him that opportunity. Uh, I think that he's really developed, like I said, in just two fights. And I think that he'll try and implement a game plan that will uh, tire out John Phillips early and then he could start going boxing heavy with him. Yeah, so we you had touched on, uh, you know, being a pro since 05 or something, man. He's 35 years old. Changes aren't coming this late in your career. Mm -hmm. We're not going to see this guy develop a ground mm -hmm. game that's, you know, going to be able to keep up with Junyun Park. That being said, man, that, that left hand is something serious, and if it lands, it will put Jung Young Park's lights out, I mm -hmm. promise. It absolutely will, but, I mean, it, it's just really, it's all he's got, you know, and it's, it's all he has in his game. He'll walk forward, throw massive hooks at you, try to back you up against the fence. I mean, you, you know, he touched on and lost four of his last five, but he has been an underdog in all five of those fights, so... Supposed to lose him, I guess, but man, he is fighting for his job on Saturday night. He needs a he needs a win really bad here, and taking this quick turnaround from Kamzat, it's 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 a bit weary to me, man, because you took a, a lot of damage just about two months ago, and now you're coming in here to fight again against a guy who throws a ton of volume at you. Um, the Iron Turtle, I think he's gonna play it smart, you know, mm -hmm. and and really put him up against the fence like he did Mark Andre Barut. I think Barut is. I mean, if if you line the middleweights up, Byrute and Phillips are you know about as identical as it gets, man. They're heavy-handed brawlers. Outside of that, you know, you take that away by putting them up against the fence and, and putting their butt on the mat. And I don't think we're gonna see anything different here from John Young Park. But this is uh, I don't want to say a step down in competition, but this is one of the easier fights I feel like that Phillips has gotten in a minute. Um, at plus two ten above it. 
you know, this guy needs a win, man. His, his back is against the corner and stuff, and he's he's not got some guy like in front of him that I think is going to steamroll him. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Jun Young Park really does need to be careful. Um, I think it's a 15 minute fight. I don't think Jun Young Park gets the finish. I'm going to go with Jun Young Park, but man, John Phillips, first round little prop bet. Something dangerous right there. Yeah, no, I, for this fight, I like the under two and a half. Now, if Park isn't able to get him to the ground, this is definitely going to be a stand and bang war. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that being said, I think he's going to get it to the ground. You know, we've talked about UK fighters not really having that wrestling skill, right. and this is another one where, mm-hmm. you know, he's had damn near 20 years to get it down, and he still hasn't. So, um, I like this one to be under two and a half. I don't know what the odds are for it, but I'd be curious to see see what they are because I think that that's a potential play for us. And then next fight, uh, we've got Claudio Silva's 14-1 and one, taking on short notice king James Krause, who's 27-8. and eight. This one going to be taking place at welterweight after uh, Krause, or Krause just dabbled there at, uh, at middleweight against Trevin Giles, man. He's... Uh, He's he's cowboy man, and to an extent, he's taking short notice fights all the time. Um, but this one right here, man, was actually out to dinner with Paul Felder when he got the call. He's you know in Abu Dhabi just cornering some fighters, and was out to dinner with Paul Felder, one of the guys that he trains with, when he got the phone call. And Paul Felder said he heard him say yes on the phone, and he already <laughs> knew what he was what he was saying yes to. Man, James Krause doesn't turn down a fight. Um, went out there and out grappled Trevin Giles for the entire first round. Lost the second round and, in my opinion, won the third round. Uh, James Krause should be on a five-fight win streak right now. Um, there, There's not a hole in James Krause's game. He does everything so well, in my opinion. And it's it's crazy to see his finishes come this late in his career where he's talked about calling it quits and stuff and, and not in his younger prime. But, you know, as he, he's... Man, his takedown defense and his takedowns himself are good, and I really think that's opening up his hands as it's gotten later in his career. But on the other hand, man, you've got a guy who's five and zero in the UFC, and know he's not fighting his consistency, you know, consistently like he'd like due to injuries. But you know, five years ago, this guy's one of the only guys to beat Leon Edwards and stuff. So you get this fight goes to the mat, and Claudio Silva is an absolute stud, but. You know, I'm curious to see how that matches up with James Krause because we've seen James Krause go out there and, and out grapple guys like Worley Alves and guys uh, like Sergio Marais and even Trevin Giles, who was a good wrestler at 185. So I'm really curious to see how the jiu-jitsu matches up. Yep. Now I, yeah, man, that's this is probably one of the toughest fights for me to call here because I think James Krause has way more tools in the toolbox to get this done. Where Claudio Silva needs to get this on the mat, and he needs to get James Krause's back to get this done. So I'm I'm right there with you. I think um, that Claudio Silva's his only path to victory is by submission, and um, you know I think that a fight to look at is the Sergio Marias fight. Uh, now Sergio in the first 30 seconds was able to grab a single leg and get James Krause mm-hmm. to the ground. Now he wasn't able to hold it, and almost directly after. James Krause threw a couple of leg kicks that really, really hurt Sergio Marias. And for two and a half rounds, James kind of just played with him. And uh, that's something that I didn't necessarily like. You know, he is getting those finishes, but for, you know, two rounds, he had the opportunity to finish it, and he just, he didn't. Mm -hmm. And it, um, you know, with somebody... I guess he knew that he had somebody like Sergio Marias hurt really badly and that there really wasn't an opportunity for him to, you know, get it to the ground like he would have liked. But still, I didn't like that he didn't have, like, that killer instinct in that fight. Um, I kind of drew comparisons to James Krause's boxing to Dustin Poirier. Kind of, he stays busy. He's always in your face. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a lot to take in, especially if you are not a striker as well. And, uh, you know, Claudio Silva, he's not a striker. He's got 10 wins by submission, uh, BJJ black belt, obviously. Um, and he's fought up to, up at middleweight himself. So he's not going to be giving up too much. Um, I, I think whenever they get in there, he'll be thick enough to where the height advantage of James Krause will mm-hmm. kind of be negated. Right. Um, I think a good fight to look at is Claudio Silva's fight with Nordin Tlaib. Uh, Tlaib looked like a killer in that he fight. He was, man. He'd won a couple in a row before. Yeah. And then Claudio was taking that fight on like a four-year layoff, too, or something. Right, too. right. Uh, Tlaib, uh, you know, he started off with really, really peppering Claudio Silva, opened him up uh, early, and I think that that's uh, a great comparison to James Krause because Tlaib was doing everything right, 
everything right and then one slip up and yeah. he got submitted and I, I think that that's exactly what we could see in this Claudio Silva fight so I I lean towards Silva and at a plus 153 you know I, I don't think that I'd play him straight because I think his only path to victory is a uh, in, with inside the distance because mm-hmm. um, I think Kraus could outpoint him to victory if, if Silva doesn't right. find it on the mat so the Silva inside the distance at plus 240 is what I'm looking at I really like those odds and I'm, I'm with you man as well uh I think that's a really good comparison, that fight that you brought up. I think Kraus does have to be perfect for 15 minutes mm-hmm. here um, or let his striking really do the, do the damage in this fight. But I like Claudio Silva even at a, at a plus 160. But I think you said, um, you know, inside the distance. I like that, brother. There's, there's a ton of value inside the distance on that. That's, where Claudio, that's where Claudio Silva is going to get it done at. Mm-hmm. So uh, that probably will be definitely, along with the Jamie Malarkey, probably be one that's released later on this week. All right, so we move on to the women's flyweight division. It's our first girl fight of the night. Uh, the Savage, Gillian Robertson versus Pollyanna Botello. Um, now, Gillian Robertson, she's not not counting the ultimate fighter. She's 4-2 and two in the UFC. Her two losses coming to uh, Marina Bueno Silva and Macy Barber. Mm-hmm. Um, now, something that I think that Macy Barber is comparable to Pollyanna Botello as far as her just power and striking. Feet, yeah. Right. Um, you know, Pollyanna Botello, she's coming in with six of her eight wins by knockout. And man, watching some tape study on her, she throws with heat. Maybe mm-hmm. the most heat other than Valentina in the flyweight right. division. Um, I, that being said, she still has amateurish striking. So she throws with a ton of power, but whenever she pumps a jab out or is retreating, her chin's straight up in the air. And I know Michael Bisping commented on it in one of her fights multiple times that, hey, you need to tuck that chin, you need to tuck that chin. It was in the Lauren Mueller fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was her latest fight. So, you know, hopefully she's addressed that because it was a glaring issue in that fight. And I don't think that that's something that you want to give up to a veteran like Gillian Robertson. Now, I know Gillian Robertson, her record's only eight and four. But if you count her amateur record, she's had 23 fights in MMA. So she's definitely got the experience advantage. Um, I would imagine Gillian Robertson wants to get it to the ground and stay on top. Mm-hmm. She, you know, she's a leech when she's on top, and it's very difficult to get her off. You're right. Now, although Pollyanna hasn't really had the chance to prove it, I can imagine her coming from Brazil. She's not just, uh, you know, dead when she's on the ground. I gotta imagine she's active, and that that's something. Uh, that her and Claudia Cadelia have been working on at Novia Uno Unayo. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I lean towards Gillian Robertson, but I think that the value for this fight is Botello inside the distance sitting at almost plus 500 right now. Um, that being said, I wouldn't play it hard at all, but Bartello throws with enough power yeah. to where it really could be, get done even at a women's flyweight. So for me, this is, is a pass fight. Um, I think... Uh, there is potential here for both girls. They, uh, they, you know, Gillian on the mat, Botella on the feet, um, and we just got in trouble with some girls' fights, you know, man. So it, I've I've learned my lesson on them. I think um, for one here, I'm going to pass, um, but I am playing another girl fight later tonight, so I haven't yeah. learned my lesson. Uh, but Gillian Robertson, man, you touched on the the veteran of status of her, man. You do look back at the amateur fights, um, and she has 23 fights on her record. She's already a seven fight UFC veteran. Um, this girl, she she gets two wins, she loses the big one. Macy Barber, she gets two wins, she loses the big one, and she's due for a win here, man. And it's it's not a big fight, um, so you know I like where her head's going to be in this one. Um, and you touched on the experience, man. This girl is she's she's fighting top notch competition all the way through the resume. She fought, you know, Hannah Goldie. She's fighting Hannah Cyphers, and she fought Cynthia Calvillo all before even getting into the UFC. Emily Whitmire, Molly yeah. McCann, all before the UFC. Yeah, so uh, not and, Molly, but, but Emily. in the UFC. Yeah, mm-hmm. so those three girls there, and Emily, all before even getting into the UFC, man. She stays grappling on the side and all kind of grappling events, and that's where she's gonna make. Um, you know, Pollyanna really pay, in my opinion. That being said, we've seen Robertson uh, make plenty of mistakes on the mat herself and, and be subbed. Uh, one thing I just I can't look over, and it's the stat here, man. If, if you look at control time, uh, it actually ranks eighth in the UFC history, but Gillian Robertson has spent 65% of her fight time in a controlling position. Where on the other hand, Botello has spent over 42% of her fight time being controlled. 
So it, it's just all in the making for Gillian Robertson to really get this girl down and lay on her to get the sub. Um, it's a complete pass for me. But uh, I think both girls have a really good chance of, you know, of their own skills getting it done under two and a half. I, I could really see Gillian Robertson is not a girl that goes to decision very much, and I think she gets this done on the mat, but it is a pass play for me. But I, without a, I, I'm leaning toward Gillian Robertson to get it done. I'd like to reiterate that this would be a personal play for Buckello inside the yeah. distance, but sitting at plus 500 and the way that she throws, I really can draw comparisons to that Macy Barber fight yeah. where she literally just overwhelmed, overwhelmed Robertson mm-hmm. with powerful striking. And I think that we could see the same, although I'm with you I, for the podcast, definitely a pass. Yeah. Um, but... You know, I, I can't I can't deny that those look pretty tasty for me. You right. know? Uh, if I'm correct, this is the main event of the prelims here. We've got Mateus Gamarat, who is 17 and 0, versus Guram Kutatiladze, who is 11 and 2. And this fight's taking place at lightweight. Um, both these guys making the UFC debut, and man, I'm super high on Mateus. Man, this is a this is a prospect that I really think has a ton of potential to make a splash in this lightweight division. At a, at five ten, man, he's got great size for lightweight. Super athletic, very very sharp hands. Um, he's accurate with his boxing, and this is a guy that when he gets the takedown, he's super active. This guy is not, uh, you know, a position type of fighter. He uh, he postures up and starts raining down on you, man, and that's what I love to see. Ground and pound is is probably one of my favorite ways to get a fight done, and and this guy is all about it, man. When he gets a fighter down, he's super super busy. He's got cr- great cardio. I know you'll touch on that. Um, where you look over at uh, Kutataladze and looking to bring Georgia, you know, home their third victory this week um, with Giga and Tuporia both coming in cashing as underdogs last weekend. You got Kutataladze sitting at a plus 250, you know, looking to do the same thing. He's on an eight fight win streak, but man, they, uh, they're, I think all eight, maybe, maybe two of them are in the same organization. He's, he's bounced around organization after organization. I don't really like that. I like you to, you know, to stay clean out the division and stuff, you know. So moving around, you know, it makes me think maybe he's, you know, it's hard to get him a fight. Is he fighting guys that are really up to his level and mm-hmm. to his caliber and stuff when he's trying to bounce around? But this guy has some of the some of the most technical striking that I've seen while watching tape study, and it really did remind me of Giga. He's got a really really great leg kick um, or, or uh, head kick. He throws the left great. He finishes like all his combinations with it. His striking defense is good. He's great with his feints. That being said, I think Mateus is is just going to dominate this fight on the mat, um, and he doesn't he doesn't hesitate to get it there. Yeah. So uh, Gamrot, although he's faced legitimate competition on his regional scene, and I did a, a quick his last ten opponents combined record is 194 and 43. And for MMA, that's kind of absurd yeah. Like to have that level of competition and not be in the UFC mm-hmm. yet. I think that this was a long time coming. Um, now, Gamrot, even though he's facing that legit competition, he's never been less than a minus 165 favorite. So, mm-hmm. realistically, he's in the same position here where he's a minus 283, and he's supposed to get this win. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that he really has a full arsenal of attacks, and he could win it on the feet and the ground, although I'm sure that he would he would rather it be on the ground. Uh, something that he does really well is an overhand right into a single leg. I know that that's a, that you love that yeah. right there that that uh that attack specifically and then you know Gamrot he also has an incredible fight IQ um, for being under 30 he listens to his coaches mid fight if they say uh, you know leg kick he'll throw a leg kick if the round's coming to an end and he notices that he'll shoot for a takedown yeah. and try and secure that round and I think that that's really going to play into his advantage if this one goes to the distance now you talked about Guram's uh, striking ability. It is legit and it does. I can see where you're drawing those comparisons to Giga. Now, um, you know, they've got them at a one inch difference height wise, but I think whenever we see Guram and, and Gamrot match up, I think Guram's one inch height advantage will be much more pronounced in the octagon. He seems to fight a whole lot taller mm-hmm. where Gamrot kind of like bunkers down and, and kind of fights like a. Uh, uh, he, he just he fights with his legs bent mm-hmm. and uh, get, uh, Guram you know something that I noticed was that you know his his high kicks like you touched on he needs minimal space to throw that mm-hmm. he will straight throw that when somebody's in that that uh, two to three range as opposed to that four mm-hmm. um, now 
You know, I think Guram, his best opportunity in this fight is to start as quickly as possible and not let Gamrot feel out that, that distance yeah. and, uh, you know, really start to start to figure him out because, you know, like we've talked about, Gamrat's gone the full 25 minutes in KSW multiple times and doesn't slow down at all. So if you give him that opportunity to kind of get reads on you and everything, it's not going to change over the course of the fight. So I think Guram coming in here as the, you know, moderate underdog, he should really try and implement his game plan as fast as possible. Um, that being said, I lean towards Matus Gamrot 100%. Yeah, so I know both of us super high on this 29-year-old prospect who's 17-0. and I think it's a long time coming into the UFC. Um, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a good opponent, man, um, for him to implement that grappling having attack. He's used to going 25 minutes. I, I'm, I'm ready to see this pace he'll put on for 15 minutes. That's going to be a good one. 100%. All right, so to kick off the main card, we've got Thomas Almeida, 22-3, and three, versus Jonathan the Dragon Martinez at 12-3. and three. This is a featherweight bout, and this will be the first time that both fighters are fighting at featherweight. Mm-hmm. So Thomas Almeida, he's coming off of a two-year layoff, uh, very similar to Brian Ortega. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I really the, the biggest question to me is what's Almeida's confidence level going into this fight? You know, before he fought Cody Garbrandt and lost, he was tw- uh, 21-0, and 0, and now he's 1-3 and 3 in his last four. A two-year layoff, there's a lot of questions coming into this, a lot of unknown coming into this. Um, I honestly think that Almeida, all around, is a better fighter than Jonathan Martinez. Uh, the only thing that Jonathan Martinez has coming into this fight is uh, momentum. Yeah. So, uh, Martinez is... Three and two in the UFC. His two losses coming to Andre Sukumtoth and Andre Yule, both fighters that I think are not as good as Thomas Almeida, yeah. uh, especially the Thomas Almeida that we know could show up. Mm-hmm. Um, Jonathan Martinez, he's a former flyweight, and whenever I watched his fights at bantamweight, I kind of noted that he had a soft body. Like he didn't have, he didn't carry a lot of muscle. Uh, his abs looked kind of underdeveloped, and maybe that could be a weak point at bantamweight. Now moving up to featherweight, I gotta imagine that he's gonna have you know some love handles. Like he's there's no way that he's uh, unless he's really been working out that yeah. he's gonna put on that extra ten pounds and wear it well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I. I definitely lean towards Almeida, and I think that he needs to look for the overhand right, especially facing Martinez being the southpaw. I think that's where Almeida will find some success. Now, if I was Martinez, the my best advice that I would give him is to try and start as fast as possible and start to work that, that striking. But realistically, if you look at Martinez's fights, he's not a fast starter. Um, His first round finishes are all by submission, and that's not what you're going to get Thomas Almeida on. Uh, I I definitely lean towards Almeida, and at nearly pick him odds, I like him. Yeah, so I'm with you, man. Uh, Thomas Almeida was was my guy, man. I'm I'm so glad to see that uh, he is returning. Um, and He drawed himself a, a pretty tough opponent here. You talked on the confidence level, and that is going to be the biggest thing that we see with Thomas Almeida is which Thomas Almeida are we going to get? Are we going to get the 21-0 you know, guy who's knocking people out like crazy, riding this wave? Or are we going to get this guy who's uh, in this you know, stint and these fights being finished and stuff? And I, I, I think we're going to see the first one, man. I think, we, uh, I think we see a great Thomas Almeida. He seems really eager to get back in there. Um, and two clash of styles, man, really couldn't be – more different you've got thomas almeida who comes from like the shuto brazil man it is it is traditional muay thai hands up i mean he's got great timing on his right hand and his elbows when people are entering in he's got phenomenal kicks body kicks leg kicks it's your traditional muay thai stance then you look over at jonathan martinez and it's it's the modern day style of mma it's the all-around game being uh, more of a well-rounded fighter he's probably going to have the wrestling advantage um that being said, man, taking it short notice when Almeida is, um, I think he's got a fire under his ass in this return, man, and, and I can't pick against my boy, so it almost almost pick him odds. Um, that's going to be released later in the week for you guys as, as well. We're both on uh, Thomas Almeida there. Yeah, I like that. And the next fight, man, is a light heavyweight between two of the best um, light heavyweight prospects, I think, that the uh, weight class is seeing right now. We have uh, Budestas Bukowskis, who's 11-2 and two fighting. The number 15 ranked Jimmy Crew, who's 11-1. and one. These guys are 26 and 24 years old, so expect to see these names around for a long time. Um, 
honestly, they're both very good, man. If one of these guys touch gold in the, you know, in the coming years, I won't be surprised. I really won't. You've got Bukowskis who, um, you know, before taking that jump up to Cage Warriors where he got the big step up in competition, he was he was literally fighting nothing but guys with losing records. They were nothing on his level, which I'm pretty sure he comes from like a pretty extensive karate background or something. Bukowskis is a is a really high level striker. Moves up to Cage Warriors where he's got some questions surrounding him. Is he gonna live up to the hype and I mean he's dusting those guys man he went right through them and became the cage warriors light heavyweight champ he's riding a seven fight win streak and you know his last fight went exactly like your Johnny Walker prediction mm -hmm. and stuff but it was just weird circumstances man so you know he the bell rang at the end of the first round the dude was like sitting up against the cage door and it got open and he fell out so they tried to stand him back up and he was wobbly so they called it so I mean I mean I mean you know, you probably shouldn't send the guy back out there when he's wobbling like that. But little funny circumstances, but a fight that Bokowskis definitely won. Now, Bokowskis, I, I feel like he has a striking advantage without a doubt here, but he's had a terrible disadvantage on the mat. He does give up the takedown super, super easy. But I do have a note here, man, that he's good about getting back to his feet. That being said, I, I personally don't think he's fought anybody that is as good as Jimmy Crute um, anywhere, uh, especially on the mat. I Both these guys combined for only four decisions total. I don't think this one sees the judges, and in my opinion, man, I, I'm I'm really high on Jim Crute. I think he's a, a top five prospect in the UFC period. Um, you know, he's under 24, like I said, 24 years old, so still super young. And we saw him uh, suffer his first loss and his first big jump up in competition um, to Misha Serkinov. And what I like better is, is him immediately getting back in there and getting another win. Um, one of these guys that I've touched on multiple times that. Uh, on their come up, not fighting guys with losing records, period. So that's 12 fights, man, with without a losing record, where the first six for Bukowskis all had losing records. So I think there's just a little bit different level of competition um, that these guys are fighting here. And Jim Crude already a four-fight veteran into the UFC. I just got to lean toward him, man. Um, I don't know if this is a three-to-one, you know, fight like the odds are saying. I think Bukowskis really does have some stuff to offer on the feet. But I'm, I'm, I think Jim Crude will dominate on the mat. I think he'll shoot a double leg early. My prediction for the podcast is I got Jim Crude with a first-round submission. Uh, I'm going to call it with a head and arm choke or head and arm triangle. I, I don't mind that at all. Um, Jim Crude, you know, he he's dangerous all around. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, of his eight – of his eight finishes, four of them are by KO, four of them are mm -hmm. by sub. So he really does have a, a well-developed game, especially for a 24-year-old. Um, you know, one thing that I did note is in, in that Paul Craig fight, he doesn't have good takedown defense himself. But when he is off his back, he has excellent sweeps. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he did that like four or five times in the fights that I was watching. And, and you know, he's he's really good and really explosive off his back. And uh, I think that, that, you know, that's how he's ending up sweeping these guys and then getting the Kimura finishes or, or something like that. So uh, where when you look over at Bukalkis, you know, he doesn't have many fights that you can that you can take from in the UFC. So you know, realistically, the competition level with Andreas uh, Michaelides, I don't know if it's really even up to par to the ones that Jimmy Crude has fought so far mm -hmm. in the UFC. Um, Bukakis looked really, really good, but he is also a former middleweight, and I think that him being as skinny as he is could play a big factor in trying to stop Jimmy Crude from getting it mm -hmm. to the ground. Um, one thing working in Bukakis' favor is that he has trained out in Albuquerque with John Jones and Andre Arvlovsky, who has apparently taken him under his wing, more or less. And, you know, I, I drew some comparisons earlier uh, to Bukalk uh, Bukalkis to uh, Alexander Rochic, mm -hmm. and I think that he has the same body style. He fights similar to him. Um, and he, he, you know, he obviously he needs to stand up on the feet. I think he's really light on his feet, and he has the speed advantage over Jimmy Crute. Um, but I'm with you. I lean towards Jimmy Crude to get this done. I'm not sure how it'll go, and I don't like those odds being as skewed as they are. Uh, but as far as just making a pick, I've got Jimmy Crude in this one. Nice. Uh, so moving on to the next fight, we've got another women's flyweight bout, and you know, I'm I'm kind of excited for it yeah. now. Uh, you, you got Caitlin, the blonde fighter, Chukagian, maybe the worst nickname <laughs> in the UFC. I don't like that at all. Versus uh, Jessica Andrade. Caitlin Chukagian's 14 and 3, when Andrade is 20 and 8. We talked about this earlier in the week. 
Andrade is a 17 fight UFC veteran and she's under 30 years old. That's nuts. That's man. insane. I mean, it's got to be at least a, a women's MMA record, yeah. uh, I got to think. Um, she's got 14 wins by finish, seven of them by KO, and seven of them by sub. Uh, in the recent years, you would think that all 14 of them are by KO, right. but uh, she does have a, a well rounded game. And coming from Brazil, I'm not too surprised that she has right. seven sub victories as well. Um, you know, one thing, Jessica Andrade at five foot one, she's always had a reach and size disadvantage. Mm-hmm. And I think over the course of her career, she's found ways to kind of weave into that distance where she can start landing her shots. And she's definitely okay with eating shots to deliver her punches. Right. Um, so with Chukagian, she's seven and three in the UFC. All of her wins are by decision. She's obviously got a way, a, a style of fighting, and that's long, long right. strikes. Um, she has a good one too, and you know, this is something that I kind of took note of because there's no fans. There's going to be you know a, a lot of opportunity for Chukagian to win over the judges with her high yas whenever right. she strikes, and I really do think that that plays a factor in the judges' eyes, yeah. even if it shouldn't. Um, it's something where no matter if she lands or not, she's she's yelling when it happens, right. and that could really you know sway the judges. Mm-hmm. Um, Another cool thing I found out about Chukagian is she's a brown belt under Henzo Gracie, and that's legit. You yeah. know, I, I'm not going to say that she's going to outgrapple Andrade by any means, but I don't think that she's going to be helpless off her back if it does go to mm-hmm. the ground. Um, you know, she she makes fighters that she's uh, facing kind of guess with feints, and she throws from a lot of different angles, and she's good at what she does. She's good at what she does. She likes to stay in that three to four range and uh, circle circles out anytime that somebody tries to close the distance. And that's where I could see Jessica Andrade kind of getting uh, held up a little bit, especially at flyweight now. You know, Chukagian's five foot nine and eight inch height advantage and a, a five or six inch reach advantage. It's going to play a factor. Yeah. So man, with this one, uh, uh, who are you finally going with? Cause I think this is probably the first one I think we talked about that we that we might disagree on. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Jessica Andrade. Yeah, so I'm on Caitlin Chukagian here. I cashed on Caitlin Chukagian at plus money against the other Valentina uh, Valentina's sister uh, Antonina. Antonina. Cashed on her big time, man. I uh, was all over her. I said she was going to dominate with that wrestling, that Antonina is not her sister. And she went out there and it was Khabib like with that wrestling, man. It was a straight domination. Um, multiple 10-8 rounds, I think, even. Kaylin Chukagian looked great. That being said, now she's got the retirement talks and stuff, man, and there's a lot of red flags coming up talking about wanting to be a mom, her last fight maybe being the last, and, I mean, Jessica Andrade is not some girl that you want to go in there with a mindset like that in. Mm-hmm. Um, man, I, I just, I can't get over um, the height difference, the reach advantage, and how well Caitlin is at fighting long, and how good she is on the mat. She uh, she's got you know submission wins. She's fought at 135 a couple times before 125 opened, and at 135 we saw Jessica Andrade have trouble with those bigger girls by getting submitted on the mat. And I think this is a girl that really can uh, you know get Andrade down and submit her. I just this is one of those cases where Andrade has now lost two in a row. She's lost to literally you know almost the top every girl at the top of the division in 115 you know the champs and stuff and rose and and yoana and now and john way lee and i think she should have made this move to 125 a long time ago now um, i know she's only 29 but you know i don't see jessica andrage being around for you know too much longer she uh, is a 17 fight ufc vet and even though she's 29 i just i don't see her around for a long time I think this is one of those end of the career weight changes. I know I'm not going to get the belt here at 115. Let me try 125. And I don't like it, man. I, I, I think she could have been matched up with a much more sizable opponent for 125 that you know could have given her a chance to get her feet wet in that division. And instead, they gave her the number two ranked fighter who's got a eight inch re- or eight inch height advantage on her. And I think she's just going to be. Um, too much for Kaylin's good at she gets on her bike she has a ton of movement this is on Fight Island it's back in the bigger octagon which is good for Chukagian and I didn't know the brown belt man but that further cements my thought that Kaylin Chukagian is going to get this done on the mat um, I don't know if she's going to sub Andrade uh, but I think she will win two of the rounds with uh, with a lot of her grappling advantage 
Uh, I, really, I wasn't expecting that take at all. I, you know, I I expect Chukagian to kind of to want to keep that distance and, and keep on Draj at arm's length, mm-hmm. especially her arm's length. Right. Um, I, I still, you know, I've seen on Draj fight. I, I here's one thing. I don't think that Chukagian's striking is on the level of Joanna Jung Jacek or Rose Nami Yunus. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are the only, you know, other than that, Wei Li Zhang, she knocks out everybody, and that's kind of a, you know. Not not comparable in my opinion, but Andrade, you know, she has fought girls like uh, like Angela Hill, yeah, so I was gonna mention. who I mean, who's a, a long striker. Now, definitely not nearly as long as right. as Chukagian, but you know, Andrade was able to counter you know any of uh, Hill's jabs and completely rush in and, and implement her offense. And then same with any of the kicks, she's able to catch them and get in close enough to deliver those overhand punches and. You know, I'm not sure how much Chukagian likes to get punched in the face. Where Andrade, she will deliver it. She lands over six fights, or six uh, punches per minute, and absorbs around five. Um, where you know Chukagian, she lands about four and absorbs four. So if you're absorbing four four strikes from Jessica Andrade, she brings the power. She man. does. She really does. But for me, I already played this one at a plus one twenty odds. Um, I might do a small double down on it if it gets any better in my favor but I feel like the name of Andrade is, is probably going to lose me some value on Chukagin as the week uh, progresses so I've actually went ahead and, and put a play on Chukagin not an official one for the podcast but it's always nice when we have a little bit of disagreement yes in the co-main event man of the evening we've got Cyril Gan, who's 6-0 and fighting Anche Dalia, who's 17-3 and and I mean, at first look at this; these odds are so wide. And that you know, for a, for a six and O heavyweight um, to be a minus six hundred favorite, that's that's almost absurd. You wow. know. Um, that being said, man, this is the best heavyweight prospect that the division has right now. Um, there are some tough SOBs at the top of the division that I don't see Cyril Gon beating right now. But that will eventually fade out, and I think this man touches gold eventually. At uh, He's 29 years old. I think he's in his athletic prime, and he sent us a Snapchat earlier in the week. This guy's frame is absolutely insane at 6'4", 83-inch reach. It's, it's almost as if you want to build a fighter. Like right. it, It's yeah. giving me several gain, man. I'm training out of the MMA factory in France. Um, and another man, another good prospect who's never fought a guy with a losing record. So at 6-0, his first professional fight. Um, he's thrown in there for a title fight. Um, then within two months later, defends it at belt. Within a year, has done defended it again and fought in the UFC. So it is, it's what you love to see in a guy who's new. It's staying active, staying ready, taking whatever fights you can. He's fought, finished five of his last six wins. The biggest difference between these guys is you've got Cyril Gain with athleticism who's so light on his feet. He's got a great pump and jab. Um, and then on the other end, you got a big old boy, in my opinion, who's real flat-footed, a little sloppy. But this is the most experienced guy Cyril Gaon's ever fought. A hundred percent. So, you know, Cyril Gaon, you, you talked about his uh, level of competition. You know, coming into this, his comp- his opponent's combined record is 42-9. and nine, Yeah. And especially in the heavyweight division, that's, that's legit, mm-hmm. you know. And this guy coming in at 17-3, and three, that's only going to add to his opponent's combined record. Right. Um, <laughs> again, you know, the frame of Cyril Gaon, it's, it's incredible, honestly. He's a build-a-fighter at heavyweight. And uh, eighty-three inch reach, you can't really ask for more. Uh, he he really he from either stance, southpaw or orthodox, he offers threats everywhere. Uh, body kicks, high kicks, his front kick. To Does a great distance. job of changing stances as well, which is not something you usually see heavyweights no, doing. Not, and not a six never. and O heavyweight either. Right, and, and you know to touch even more on on his experience outside of the octagon, he's twelve and O in Muay Thai and. It's it shows it yeah. shows every single time he's out there and he's very calm whenever he is you know fighting uh, he's you know he can listen to his coaches mid fight and address what they're asking them to do almost every single uh, at all points in time yeah. whether it's the third round or you know anything so when you move over to Dalia yes it's his UFC debut but he does have some legitimate experience in Ryzen or PFL mm-hmm. and. Uh, 
you know, he's he's finished a lot of his wins. He's got six wins by KO and seven wins by sub. So, uh, you know, something that I noted here is that he's not great anywhere, but he's good everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I've seen a couple of his fights where he's relentless with his takedown pressure. And when he is on the ground, man, he moves very light for a heavyweight as well. You know, he has great top pressure and everything. And, you know, it, it's another one of these things. I can say all of this, but he's also up against Cyril Gaon. So mm-hmm. I don't know if he's going to be able to implement any any of that um, he does sit on his punches and he throws extremely hard and having somebody who is only six and0 in the UFC octagon it's really tough to call that he's a that he should be a minus 600 yeah. favorite so I do think that these odds are really skewed and we are going to be making some plays on this for our podcast picks mm-hmm. um, but it's you know it's a it's a gone pick with a little bit of hedging for Delia absolutely so one thing I've got to touch on Delia there is uh, his only loss since 2014 is to the UFC caliber opponent, man, and Marcin Tibera. Mm-hmm. So this is this guy is no slouch here, but I think uh, the athleticism advantage that Cyril Gaon is going to bring in here, the technicality, the pump and jab that he has, I think it's just going to be too much. And I just, if this fight gets dirty and it gets wild, man, the league is... Man, I'd like him to capitalize on some veteran experience. I know I, I texted you earlier, and I was like, when you do your tape study on him, text me. Mm-hmm. Because the dude is nuts, man. He'll he'll get a guy on the ground and just stand up and start soccer kicking him. This this guy is fault pride style fights, and um, he's going to be in Cyril Gaon's face, man. I think he really will try to, to pressure this newcomer, but I just don't think it's going to work out in his favor, man. I, I don't agree with the minus 600, but... Just, I mean, just looking at these two guys, man, Cyril Gaon's got a ton of ways to get this fight done. A hundred percent. And that's why, you know, I like, I think the, the play that we're going for is a Gaon TKO. And and even money, man. And even money, it's hard to pass up. That's too hard to pass up. Um, and then that, realistically, the only way we see Dalia winning is by catching a lucky uh, punch and, and mm-hmm. kind of getting Gaon out there by TKO as well. And that's sitting at a plus 850 right now. So that's also a tough one to pass up. I think we're going to do a little hedging by, yeah. use, by doing like a .15 unit on that. But, um, you know, I, I like that. I like that fight. Cyril Gaon... Uh, TKO. I like that. Yeah. All right, so now we move on to the main event. Man, one that we've both been looking forward to for a while. Yes, sir. Finally coming together. I know it's the second or third time they've tried to put this fight together, and I'm glad they kept these two matched together. 100%. Now, this one's at featherweight. We've got Brian T-City Ortega, 14-1, and one, coming off of a two-year layoff from an absolute beating from Max Holloway mm-hmm. versus the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung at 16-5. and five. Um, so, okay, a couple of takeaways for this fight. Um, yes, there are a ton of un- unknowns for Ortega. And that two-year layoff, him still being under 30 years old, I got to imagine that that two-year layoff only did him good. Mm-hmm. He's got to be sharpening his skills, um, you know, taking that time off for his chin to, to you know, heal or for him to just kind of get his mind right. Right. Uh, especially being undefeated up until that uh, up until that moment, it had to have taken a toll on him mentally and I think that that 2 years actually is going to work in his favor. Now, what doesn't work into his favor is that the Korean Zombie starts off strong and heavy right off the bat. Right. And uh, you know, he's definitely nobody who you can have ring rust coming into it and and it work out well for you. Um, Ortega, you know, when you know when I say that he's improving his skills in that two years, you know he's he has Henner Gracie in his corner, and Henner Gracie has so many good relationships with other fighters in the UFC. I can imagine him bringing in high level competition yeah. to get him prepared for this fight. Where uh, the Korean Zombie, he he trains out of his own gym, so he's teaching his own classes. I can't imagine him having much more, much better competition to sharpen his tools with, and. Uh, Realistically, I think that that's going to not work in his favor. You know, we 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 talk about the submissions and the uh, some of the finishes that he's had. A lot of those are in 2013, 2012, 2011, 2010, and I don't think that you can take those into consideration when you're judging this fight. I think you got to look at his fights uh, post Jose Aldo, and uh, when you do, you know, you look at. Yair Rodriguez, where he was dominating that fight. I mean, we talked about him going before he got knocked out, Mm -hmm. probably winning four to one in the judges' eyes. And, you know, realistically, he overextended himself and he got caught. And that's something that you got to take into consideration, even though he was winning that Mm -hmm. fight. Another thing, I think Yair was 
a little overhyped. I mean, he was coming off of the loss to Frankie uh, Frankie Edgar, and he got mauled in that fight. And then you, you look at the other two fights, like the Korean Zombies uh, win streak. It's Frankie Edgar and Ronaldo Moicano, both guys that Ortega has finished first. And Ortega was the first one to finish both guys mm-hmm. in their entire career. So, you know... Ortega really has kind of given the blueprint for this fight uh, as far as beating the Korean Zombie, and I I like him at, at plus 160. I think that this might be another one that we don't agree on completely, but just comparing Ortega's uh, resume with, with uh, the Korean Zombies, I think recently you've got to take uh, Ortega's you know youth, uh, experience up until this point, you've got to take that into consideration where I don't think that the Korean Zombies necessarily uh improving himself day in and day out like i think ortega is you know he in his two fights that he's had they're you know less than a round Mm -hmm. combined so i i just i lean towards ortega and and i think that there are some some things that he has to take into consideration he he has to fully commit to his strikes if he throws out a pawing jab like morcano did yeah, the Korean zombie's going to come over the top and rock his ass. But Ortega took Max uh, Max Holloway's best strikes for four rounds, and Holloway couldn't put him out, right. you know? Uh, it was a doctor stoppage, but I I think that, you know, you can't even call into question Ortega's chin because he was able to take the best punches that, that Max Holloway had. Yeah, man, so another one, like I said, we had, we don't agree on, and we both been going back and forth on this one because this is such a good fight, and I think the one thing we can agree on is it should be probably closer to a pick em. Neither one mm-hmm. of these guys should be at the odds that they're at, but, um, and I also think we can agree that this doesn't hit the judges' scorecard. There's, mm-hmm. um, you're looking at you know 40 fights between these two guys almost, and single digit decisions between the two. So I don't expect this one to see the judges' scorecard. But the first thing I do want to touch on is just the jujitsu between these two guys. If people think Ortega is about to come out here and just do what he did to Cub Swanson, it's not going to happen, man. Um, there is videos of Henry Gracie rolling with the Korean Zombie in his gym and talking about the levels of the, you know, just the guys that training with the Korean Zombie. And then when he trains with Zombie, dude, I mean, it's nothing but praise for this guy's jiu-jitsu. Not being said that it is... Brian Ortega's jiu-jitsu because like Joe Rogan said it comes from the motherland Mm -hmm. man it is from Henry Gracie it's from Hori and Gracie it comes from the foundation of jiu-jitsu you're not going to have you're not going to find jiu-jitsu as that as sharp as as Brian Ortega he's been doing it since he was 10 years old man Mm -hmm. um that being said man uh, Henry's not going to be in the corner and I don't know what to think about that because that's his longtime mentor but Henner did make a good point in his little video to Brian. If there's a coach Brian doesn't need, it's his jiu-jitsu coach. Mm-hmm. You know? And I, I really do think that is a good point because that has been ingrained in Brian's head for a, a very long time now. The next thing I want to touch on, um, these guys kind of like... There's not as much animosity by no means between the fight, but wanting to keep the fight together and stuff, it reminds me of uh, Colby and Usman a little bit, man. Like, mm-hmm. they really want this fight to happen. These guys have beaten the same people on their come up. Um, it's a fight that everybody really wants to see because, um, you know, Max and Volk are kind of in their own little wor- you know world right there at the top. And these guys, you know, with inactive as Brian Benn, he's still at number two and stuff. And... The UFC, and I think everybody else agrees, that right underneath Max and Volk are these two guys, and it's a fight that we really need to see. Um, I mean, even, you know, Brian's title run and, and Chan Sung Jung here recently, um, neither one of these guys have, have the wins that they have. The opponents are not even in the top 15 anymore. So, like, are you know, they're not fighting the new wave of the featherweight division, but I still agree with the UFC that that these are your your next two contenders and without a doubt these guys get the next title shot in my opinion unless the beat goes out there and does something wild um i think i just got to touch on man is the boxing of the korean zombie and i think that's what's going to be the biggest difference in this fight and that's what's making me lean toward the korean zombie here and you touched about the moicano getting lazy with that jab we saw ortega get very lazy with the jab um, and with the hook, the left hook, man, or with the right hook, and Max came over the top of both of those. Um, he came over top of the jab a whole bunch, and I mean, after he, Ortega would swing the right hook and miss, I mean, Max would grab it and put it back up next to his face. It was disrespectful. Um, I think the Korean Zombie really does have striking 
very similar and on the level of Max Holloway. I think it's something that seriously slept on. Um, he or, he absorbed 290 significant strikes from Max Holloway alone. Brian Ortega hasn't landed that many in his previous five fights, so I'm curious to see what the output's going to be on his end. Is he once Brian started getting punched, man, he really was hesitant to throw in that fight. Um, and when you got the Korean Zombie, who um, has not even taken 290 significant strikes in his entire UFC career, so it's you know it's a guy who's pretty punchable versus a guy who's got a better boxing defense. And I think that's going to be the biggest um, you know the biggest challenge that Ortega's going to have to overcome is on the feet, because Zombie goes all the way back to the WEC days, man. He's been fighting for a while and. At 33 years old, man, he's a lot of people think you know he's still kind of in his prime and stuff right now. He had to take the big layoff because of the military sentence, which really puts a hit on Korean fighters, you know, um, you know, career puts a big hold on it. But he's looked good since he's been back, man. And the mistakes in Brian's game, I wonder if it's changed over the two years because if it hasn't, I think the Korean Zombie will make him pay. So officially, you're going with the Korean Zombie. Officially, my pick would be with the Korean Zombie, 100. percent I but think officially, I'm going with Ortega. At minus 180, I don't know how I could play it. Right. But at minus plus 160, I can see why you play Ortega 100. percent I think this is a much closer fight than the odds say. Um, 100%. We've just seen Ortega. I don't know, man. We've seen him in his fight with Clay Guida and stuff, and even with Moicano, he's losing those before he caught the knee up the middle before he pulled the guillotine. Um, Ortega doesn't need to start slow, man, because Zombie will make him pay. Uh, I liked what I told you about Ortega wrapping up. You know, anytime they clinch up, he, he instantly grabs him for that neck. He really makes you think, you know, that the submissions come and he threatens with it a whole lot. I'm so excited for this fight, man. But uh, I think Korean Zombie wins. I think he beats Volkanovski in 2021. I think the Korean Zombie is your next featherweight champ. Whoa, whoa, I did not expect that. So beat will be the featherweight champion, <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. So uh, fight of the night, I think you might have already touched on that a little bit, but what do you have as your fight of the night? Yeah, so my fight of the night is John Young Park versus John Phillips. I think that's going to be a two middleweights Slobber that knocker. want to throw down. Yeah, man, yes. any fight with uh, Phillips in it, man, if they're willing to stay and bang with him, it's going to be a good one. Um you know, I almost said it was my fighter to watch because he's coming off of a big layoff and stuff, but my fight to watch is Thomas Almeida and Jonathan Martinez. Martinez is, is a guy that he really does bring it to, and I think it's a guy that is going to stand in front of Thomas and really let Thomas's striking shine. I like this to be a, a really exciting fight. I honestly could see both guys hitting the canvas at least once in this one as well. I'm going to go with Martinez and Almeida being my fight of the night. So I, I like it. Uh, my fighter of the night... Uh, I don't want to. Is this is this yours as well? Nah. Okay, cool. So my fighter of the night, I guess, is Jimmy Crute. Uh, I think that he could get it done in spectacular fashion, but still, he's green, and I'd like for him to prove himself just a little bit more in the UFC before I really jump on on his bandwagon. So I'm leaning with Zombie to win the fight, and that's why I'm not saying Ortega is my fighter to watch off of the two year layoff. Um, I've really battled back and forth with me um, for this fighter to watch because. Or I think Maxim Grishin really is going to shine in this fight, and we didn't really get to see the real Maxim Grishin when he fought at heavyweight. Right. But my fighter to watch, man, is going to be in the prelim main event. It's the newcomer in Mateus Gamrot. I think the guy really has the potential to make a really big splash into the lightweight division at 5'10 and very well-rounded, been tested over 25 minutes a couple times already. I like that guy to, to really, uh, you know, to not. I don't want to say steamroll through the – lightweight division but at 17 and 0 and 29 he's in his athletic prime i think this guy uh, starts getting some good matchups after this i like it yeah so make sure to follow us on twitter um instagram we're always tracked at bed mma make sure to like and subscribe to the video i know we're only about 20 subscribers away from somebody getting the fight poster there um we got we got two of them so uh dash and blast you might just get one of them yourself <laughs> uh Anything else you want to add, man? Uh, shout out Ethan Chapman, too. I appreciate you commenting and everything else. But, yes, sir. Uh, on Twitter as well, I think you said yeah, something. So yeah, we do yeah. appreciate the support, you guys. As always, let us know who you guys think are going to win, and I hope you're cashing with us. Yes, sir. Peace.